Well, what a joy it is uh, to be with you and to see you again. Many of you are in the exact same seat as I saw you <laughs> last time. I'm assuming you went home after the conference two years ago. <laughs> uh, the front row here, they're in exactly the same place. So John MacArthur calls them the front row funnies. So uh, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> well, the theme of our conference is right now counts forever, right? And so, your work right now counts forever. It really matters how you do your work. And so, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, a chap Ephesians chapter 6, and I want to begin by reading verses 5 through 8, and in this message, we're going to survey the whole Bible, and as time would permit, we're going to look at a lot of different verses, but this will be the, the launching pad, the beginning place. The title of this is, Working as for the Lord. And so, in Ephesians chapter 6, I want to begin reading in verse 5, slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your, of your heart as to Christ, and not by way of eye service as men-pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him." In these verses, we clearly see that your work matters to God. Whenever the people of God have come back to the Word of God, they always come back to the fact that your vocational calling is a sacred calling unto God. As Martin Luther once said, there are no small occupations, that everything that you do, whatever that is, whether you're a white-collar or blue-collar worker, whether you work in a field or in an office, wherever God calls you to put your shoulder to the plow and perspire in the field and to work, you are to do that as unto the Lord. And it was this realization that the Reformation, the Protestant movement of the Reformation came back to recover. It was known as the, the Protestant work ethic. It was known as the Calvinistic work ethic. And our country was founded even in New England with this Calvinistic work ethic, that your work is a part of the will of God for your life, that you have not been saved to sit, that you have been saved to work and that your work is a means by which you will glorify God. And in the Reformation with the, the five solas, that apex sola, sola deo gloria, for the glory of God alone, they understood that as the umbrella over not just salvation, but the umbrella over everything. That not only is your salvation unto the glory of God, but how you carry out your work is to be done for the glory of God. And so, if right now counts forever, and it does, then your work counts forever. And so, what I want to do in the time that I have with you is to, is to really have a, a, a quick survey of the Bible, and I want to set before you six headings as we think about work as a Christian. And so, the first heading that I want to set before you is work assigned, work assigned. And if you'll turn back to the book of Genesis, if you have trouble finding it, go to the table of contents, 
and turn to the right, and it'll be the first book after the table of contents. Genesis chapter 1, and I want to begin reading in verse 26, and everything begins here as it relates to work. And we read in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so, we as human beings, beginning with Adam and then Eve, have been uniquely made in the, in the image of God, in the likeness of God, to be like God in a way that is distinct from the rest of His creation, such that we are set apart in the created order in a higher place than animals and and, and uh, trees and, and rivers, we uniquely are made in the likeness of God. We are image bearers, imago Dei, of God. So, what is number one on that list? What is the first thing that God assigns here in verse 26, and it will be repeated in verse 28? Number one on the list in this text is that Adam would work because God is a working God, and if Adam is to be like God, then Adam must work because God is a working God. God is not a sitting God in the sense of being inactive. Though He is enthroned in the heavens, He is working the affairs of providence every moment of every day. God is answering prayer. God is opening blinded eyes to see the truth of the gospel. God is opening hardened hearts to receive the message of, of saving grace. Uh, God is overturning the, the resistance of the world to the gospel. Every second, God is working. God's not passive. God is active. And because of that, we are made in the image of God, and we are made for a task, and that is to work. God never intended life to be a vacation. He intended it to be an occupation, and we are to work. And so we read, continue to read in verse 26. You can see it for yourself in your own Bible. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, here's number one. And let them, notice the them, it's in the plural, so this goes beyond just Adam. And I think beyond Adam and Eve, this extends to all whom Adam would represent as the federal head of the human race, this would apply to you and me as well. Let them rule over, and now in this verse, over is used five times. So, we see the emphasis that God is placing here that we are to preside over God's creation, and we are to work. Let them rule, which means to have dominion, and to subjugate over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing. And so, here God assigns work to Adam. You'll also note that this precedes the fall. This precedes original sin that the curse is not assigning work. God assigned work before there was original sin and before there was the curse. This is the perfect will of God for man to work. And so, we learn much here about work assigned. And this creation mandate has never been rescinded. It has never been annulled. It is so foundational that, in a sense, it's never been repeated in the Bible because it is so glaringly foundational that everything else will be built upon this creation mandate. And it is still a part of God's will for our lives that we do the work that is assigned to us to do. Therefore, Idleness is a sin, and industry is a virtue. Therefore, laziness is ungodly, and labor is godly. Receiving a handout, if you can work, is ungodly. Working to earn your livelihood 
brings honor and glory to God. So that's where we begin in our survey, work assigned. Now, if you will, come to Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to see the second heading, which is work hindered. First work assigned in Genesis 1, now second work hindered in Genesis chapter 3, and I want to look specifically with you at verses 17 and 18, because sin has left a devastating effect upon man's assignment of work. And so, in verse 17, we read these startling words, cursed, severely judged, is the ground because of you, because of your original sin. In toil you will not eat of it all the days of your life. This word toil in the original Hebrew Uh, speaks of pain, hardship, sorrow, back-breaking sweat, producing labor and work. And so, the creation mandate, the work assigned will continue, but now you're going to be pushing the rope uphill. Now there will be difficulty in a fallen world because of God's curse upon the world Nevertheless, you are to continue your work, and he ends, or he says in verse 17, at the end, he says, all the days of your life. This curse will never be, uh, will never be lifted, and you will work all the days of your life as long as you are physically able to do so, and by this, you will continue to glorify God. So we come to verse 18, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. And the, now there is the introduction of, of difficulties, literal thorns and thistles, and many other speed bumps and roadblocks and difficulties and, and, and challenges are now thrown into the planet that makes the workplace a very challenging and difficult thing. And this was done not by Satan, this was done by God Himself. And so He says, and you will eat the plants of the field. To be vegetarian, of course, is part of the curse. (laughs) Sorry, I'm just biblical. (laughs) Romans 14.3 says, he who is weak in faith eats vegetables only. So... (laughs) Sorry, just quoting the Bible. (laughs) So, verse 19, by the sweat of your face, and he's talking about your work, that there will be perspiration streaming down your face, and it will be dripping off the tip of, of, of your nose from your hard labor. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the earth. So, Adam and for all of your descendants, you will no longer be living in a garden, you will be living in a thorn-infested field, and you are to continue to glorify me by carrying out the work that I have assigned to you, and it is to be a continual remembrance of original sin, that this, this, this human race has risen up, in, as R.C. would say, in cosmic rebellion against me, and you are to work till you return to the ground. And God created Adam out of uh, the dust of the ground, and he was to continue to work until he is placed back into the ground. So, I would say to you from this, as long as you are alive on planet earth, there is work for you to do. Work in the sense of a vocational calling and work in a sense, even after you would retire from whatever your career has been, nevertheless, you are to work until you are placed back into the ground. And so, you may retire from your career, but you will never retire from the work that God has assigned to you. At the end of Moses' life, 
He spent the last 40 years of his life, the greatest challenge of his life, leading Israel into the, to the very precipice of the promised land. And Caleb, when he was advanced in years, he, he didn't retire. He said, I want the biggest mountain with the biggest giants. You assign that to me. And the apostle John, at the end of his life, he, he's still writing books in the Bible, and he is still serving the Lord. And so this is work hindered. And so you and I just need to understand this. There is not intended to be an easy job anywhere. And if you're looking for an easy job, you're not going to find it because of the curse that God has placed on creation. It will be met with difficulty and challenges and roadblocks. Now, third, I want you to come to Psalm 128. Psalm 128, and I want you to note third, work blessed. Psalm 128, and I want to look at the first two verses of of this psalm. And he begins by saying how blessed, despite the curse that is upon work, the earth, and our labor on the earth, there nevertheless is a blessing that God pronounces upon the worker and the one who works to provide for his family and to provide for others. And so beginning in verse 1, he begins, how blessed. In the Hebrew, it's in the plural, which is, oh, the blessednesses, the, the multiplicity of, of blessing, the fullness of, of blessing. How blessed is, is everyone, and he now mentions three things. Number one, who fears the Lord, synonymous with saving faith synonymous with the one who stands in reverential awe in the presence of God, realizing who he or she is and who God is, and knows the Lord. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Every unbeliever fails to take God seriously. It is only the believer who genuinely takes God seriously from His Word. That's number one, fears the Lord. Number two, obeys the Lord because all true fear of God always leads to obedience to God. If you're disobedient, then you have failed to fear God. And so he says, who walks in his ways. Walks is a metaphor for daily living. We would say today, daily Christian living where the rubber meets the road, one foot in front of another, on a narrow path, headed to a destination in front of us. It speaks of how we conduct ourselves in, in, in life. He walks in no, His ways, not your own ways. No, the one who fears the Lord walks in the ways of the Lord as a result of reverencing and worshiping God. But there's a third step here in verse 2. He says, when you shall eat of the fruit of your hands. And the fruit of your hands is really your work. In fact, the word for fruit in the original Hebrew is translated labor or work. I'm preaching out of the New American Standard, and it's metaphorically translated as fruit, but it's literally, you shall eat of the labor of your hands. And so he says, you're to have your shoulder to the plow. He says, you're to have your hands out in the field and in the harvest. And you are blessed of God. Now, the word blessing in the book of Psalms is used in a twofold way. Uh, there is an eternal blessedness, which is our state of standing in grace, justification by faith. But there's also a temporal dimension to this word as it relates to one's personal joy, we might say happiness, 
uh, as we are graced and favored by God. We are satisfied by God. And so what he is saying here is that when you fear God, you will walk in His ways. And when you walk in His ways, included on this path is the work that God has assigned you to do, your vocational calling. And you will be immensely satisfied as you carry out what God has called you to do. Out of the Reformation, there, there was the realization, not only is the minister called to preach the Word and shepherd the flock, but even the blacksmith is called by God to do the work that he's called to do. That even the farmer, the housewife, are called by God to do what God has put before them to do. But no one is not called who fears the Lord. And we glorify God and we honor God by our work. And on the last day, when we stand before the Lord, every Christian will stand in the judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, for we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and that we refers to believers. And we will be appraised by our master as a servant, slave to our master. Have we been faithful in his household to do the work that he has assigned us to do? And we will give an account to the Lord on that last day for the use of our time, for the use of our talent, and how we have employed it and invested it in serving others. Martin Luther, when he preached on Psalm 128, had this to say. Let, let me quote Martin Luther as he is expounding on Psalm 128, verses 1 and 2. He says, your work is a very sacred matter. God delights in it. This praise of God, Luther writes, meaning God's praise of work, should be inscribed on every tool and on every forehead and on every face. In other words, that it would be constantly before us. He says, the world does not consider labor a blessing, but flees from it and hates it. It cannot wait to stop working. But, Luther writes, the pious, referring to the godly, who fear the Lord, labor with a ready, cheerful heart. The world inverts the thought, meaning the world has it the complete opposite of what the Word of God says. And I wonder how much have we been influenced by what the world says about work, as though we can hardly wait to get out of it. The world inverts the thought and says, miserable shall you be, for these things must forever be endured and born, close quote. No, Luther understood that there is a vocational calling on every believer, and as long as we are on planet earth and breathing, there is work to be done that is placed before us by the Lord. Now, I want you to come to the book of Ecclesiastes, and this leads to the fourth heading, which is work enjoyed. Work enjoyed. And I want you to come to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and what we're going to discover is that this work that God has given us to do, has assigned to us, that is hindered by the curse, it is so empty if you do not fear God. It is so meaningless to go to the office if you do not live with an eternal perspective, if you only do this for your employer, how empty and vain it is. If you do not do this for the ultimate sovereign of the universe, no matter how mundane or trivial it might appear to be to the world, then it's just going to be vanity of vanities. All is vanity." 
So please note in chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities. It's repeated twice to bring emphasis, all is vanity. The word vanity literally means vapor or breath, like a puff of smoke. It, the idea is there's no substance to it. There's no meaning to it. It's just hot air, but it's empty. Um, it's meaningless and pointless. It's futile and unsatisfying. That's what this word means. Vanity of vanities, meaning this is the epitome of vanities. And when he says all is vanity, that includes work. Now look at verse 3, lest there be any, any misunderstanding that this includes work. Verse 3 says, what advantage does man have in all his work? That's what we call a rhetorical question, the answer of which is so obvious it does not even need to be answered. The value, the profit is nothing nothing eternal, nothing that glorifies God. What advantage does man have in all his work? The answer is a resounding nothing. Now, the word work here means trouble, labor, toil, and it is analogous to working by the sweat of your brow, which is assigned to every one of us. So, what meaning could there be in going to work? What, what meaning could there be to go into the marketplace, uh, to, to go into the office space? What meaning could there be to, be to stay at home and be a housewife and go through the endless routine? Well, look at verse 8. He in intensifies this and says, all things are wearisome. That includes work. All things are wearisome. In other words, grueling. He says, man is not able to tell it, not able to tell just how grueling it is. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. As, as you behold the fruit of your labor, you can never be ultimately satisfied if it's just you and work. And then he says, nor is the ear filled with, with hearing, and no matter what feedback you receive from others, and where Solomon is headed with this, if God is not the driving motivation of your heart and your soul, and if you do not believe that you are there in the very epicenter of the will of God for your life, and that God has created you to work, then your, your labor it's going to make no sense to you. So, verse 9, that which has been is that which will be. In other words, you're going into the office will just be same old, same old. You're just going to be going through the empty, vain repetition and circles of life. You're not going anywhere. It doesn't amount to anything. At the end, you die. You leave it all behind. Well, what was this about? What was this for? So, come now to chapter 2 and verse 18. And in chapter 2 and verse 18, Solomon addresses the futility of work and labor if it is done without fearing God. And so, in chapter 2 and verse 18, thus, I hated all the fruit of my labor in which I had labored under the sun. I don't have time to do word studies on all these words, but, but what he is saying, for all the toil, for all the trouble, for all the labor, I found zero pleasure in it, any lasting pleasure in it. I saw no purpose in it. And so, in verse 20, therefore, I am completely I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor. It was, I, I'm just left hopeless. 
So note verse 23. Because all his days, <laughs> your entire working career, your entire life, because all his days, his task, referring to work, is, note these next two words, is painful, Hebrew word meaning sorrowful, and grievous, that's a Hebrew word that means full of anger and vexation and intense negativity. Even at night, his mind has no rest. What's this for? What's this about? Where is this going? Now, note verse 24. This is an important, this is a tipping point. There is a sudden shift in his attitude about work. I want you to see this. There is nothing better and this word for better is the word that's used in Genesis 1, God saw it and it was good. God saw it and it was good. Same Hebrew word, tob. There is nothing better, nothing more pleasant, nothing of greater excellence for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor <laughs> is good. So what made the difference? How did, how did this go from grievous and painful and vanity of vanities to now his labor is good? How did this shift? How did we go from grievous to good? How did we go from painful to pleasurable? Look at the end of verse 24. Here's your answer. This also I have seen, that it is from the hand of God, that it was God who put this assignment in front of me. For Solomon, it was to be king of Israel. For you and me, it's to be a school teacher, it's to be a CPA, it's to be a housewife, it is to be a salesman. But if you don't see that it's from God, you're going to be one frustrated employee. You're going to be one frustrated mom with four kids. You're going to be one frustrated person if you do not see that God has assigned you work, no one gets a free pass, and that this assignment has come from God Himself, and there is great enjoyment if you do it with a God-fearing heart attitude. Now look at verse 25, the next verse. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without Him, capital H, without God? And this again is a rhetorical question. The answer is so obvious it does not need to be answered. There is no enjoyment in work independent of the one who assigned it to you. There is no enjoyment from work without the realization that this is the will of God for my life. And there is no enjoyment from God without realizing that there are no easy jobs on the planet, that it has all been affected by the curse. If you're trying to find a job that is easy, you'll have to go to another planet. <laughs> or it's really not a job. And so he concludes the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, verse 13. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep His commandments. And that's the golden key that unlocks the door to a life of fulfillment in the workplace. No matter how menial it may seem to you, do it for the glory of God and give a good testimony on the last day to the Lord. Now, come to the New Testament. Come to Ephesians chapter 6, the passage that I read earlier, and this is the fifth heading, work rewarded, because God promises a reward, whether it's in this lifetime or in the life to come. Nevertheless, God is an impartial all-knowing judge, and when He sees you doing your work as unto Christ, He notes it and He will reward it. 
So in Ephesians chapter 6, I'm just going to have to quickly go through this, slaves, and let me just say this applies equally to all employees who are under an employer. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. Be obedient is in the present tense, meaning you are to be always obedient to them. It is in the active voice, meaning you are to take action to be obedient. And third, it's in the imperative mood. This is not an option. It's not a suggestion. It is an apostolic command from Jesus Christ. Be obedient to your masters. I'll never forget the graduation service at the Master's University when John MacArthur addressed the graduating class, and he said, I have one last thing to say to the graduating class. Everyone just leaned forward. People pulled out pens, got out paper, write this down. He says two things. Show up early and do what you're told to do with a good attitude. And you'll end up being the president of the company. How simple is that? that that's what Paul is saying here to the slaves. Just show up early and do what you're told to do, and do it with a great attitude. Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, and notice how it is to be carried out with fear and trembling. I don't have time to do word studies uh, on this, but fear, phobos, phobia, and trembling, literally, you take this so serious that there is an inner uh, trauma is how this word comes into the English language. It's traumatic because of what follows, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. So you don't work for that boss. He's just, even if he owns the company, he's just middle management. The Lord Jesus owns the cattle of a thousand hills, and the fullness of the earth thereof is His. He is the King of kings. He is the boss of bosses, and you're serving Him. You need this higher spiritual, eternal perspective. Verse 6, not by way of eye service as men pleasing. In other words, you're not doing this just to please the boss. What what, what a shallow worldview that is. What a shallow perspective on life that is. He says, but as slaves of Christ, doulos, doing the will of God. What is the will of God? For you to obey your master, for you to do the work that He has required you to do, and for you to do it with fear and trembling, with sincerity in your heart, not dragging your feet, not procrastinating, not trying to negotiate your way out of this. Nike, just do it for the glory of God, by the grace of God, in the will of God as unto God Himself. Then He adds, from the heart. I mean, this is just plunging deeper and deeper. There's no escape clause. There's no escape hatch from the heart. He says in verse 7, with good will. It means the idea is kindness. Render service as to the Lord referring to Jesus Christ, who is our ultimate master, and not to men. What, what a limited way that would be to live. I mean, you'd be playing handball against the curb if you're living in such a low perspective of life. He says in verse 8, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he, referring to the slave or the employee, will receive back from the Lord. Now, your master may pass you over for the promotion. Your master may pass you by for the raise. That's okay in this sense. The Lord Himself sees, He knows, He's recording it, and He will reward you. Now, it may not be in this lifetime, or it may be in this lifetime. That's left to His sovereign discretion. But one way or another, whether now or later, He will pay you back because you work for Him, and he's a, He is a benevolent master. He is a loving master. 
And He will take care of you. And it will come back to you in the end. Whether slave or free. I just have one last heading, and I'm looking at my friend the clock. And the sixth and final heading is work reinforced. As we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, I just need to add this. Work reinforced, because as we progress in the progressive revelation, as the Bible continues to unfold, we do not see a diminishing of work. If anything, we see a heightening of work. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 11, and and, and let me set the backdrop very quickly, there were people so looking for the return of Christ, they were quitting their jobs. They were withdrawing out of society. Like sometimes we may feel like doing the way the culture is going. And Paul has to address this. No, you cannot stop working. And so he says in verse 11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business. Stop sticking your nose into everyone else's business. You just do what has been given to you to do. And he says, and work with your hands, just as we commanded you. So it's a command to work. Verse 12, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in need. And Paul's point is, it would be a horrible testimony for you to loaf at work. It would, it would be uh, uh, counterproductive as, your, as a Christian, your witness to the world, for you to try to pull back from your labor. No, you glorify God, and you give evidence that you've been made in the image of God who is a working God as you do your work. And so my last verse, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, which was my father-in-law's favorite verse in the entire Bible, I, I need to quote it here. He's in heaven right now. If I've heard this verse one time, I've heard it a hundred times. If a man will not work, as he would say that to his (laughs) son-in-law, if you catch my drift. If a man will not work, then neither let him eat, because his hunger pains will give him a new perspective on work. It'll be a new motivation for him to get working if there's no free handout. After I graduated from seminary, they gave me the responsibility of being over the benevolence ministry to, to give money to people who had no means, and so they gave me, let's just say it's $20,000 in my budget. So I thought, okay, I came up with a list of work assignments. Rake the leaves, take out the trash, sweep the gym, and if you come passing through town and the word was out, we'll just dole out money, great, we've got some work for you to do which elevates your dignity. At the end of the year, I still had (laughs) $20,000 in my budget because everybody wanted a free ride. Everyone wanted a handout. Everyone thought they were entitled to a free lunch. But if a man does not work, neither let him eat unless you're physically or mentally unable to do so. Well, do you get the point? So let me ask you this. Are you working? Are you perspiring? Are you laboring? Do you know what it is God has you to do? Because there's no one on planet earth who has nothing to do but hang out. You need to find the work. Whether you're paid for it or not, you could be a volunteer worker. You glorify God with your work. Now, the last thing I want to tell you in 30 seconds is this. You'll never work your way to heaven. There's only one way to go to heaven, and that's by the work of another. The Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work and His sinless life and substitutionary sin-bearing death upon the cross 
And it is only by the finished work of Jesus Christ is salvation offered to anyone and everyone as a free gift. And you must come to Him with an empty hand and humble yourself and say, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Jesus only died for one kind of person, and that's a sinner. He didn't die for good people. He died for really bad people. And you must come to the place where you recognize that you are what God says you are, which is a sinner who has fallen short of the glory of God, and that there is only one way of salvation, and it's not through your works. It is entirely through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ who came on a mission to seek and to save that which is lost. And if you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, right now, this moment, you are lost and you are perishing and you are under the wrath of God. But if you will flee to Christ by faith, if you will repent of your sins, you may enter into the finished work of Jesus Christ and find rest from your labor in Him who says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my burden is easy, and my yoke is light. Believe upon the one who has done the work for you, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.